Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight on this Thursday, March 28th. Betters will bet where it's most convenient for them. Just how convenient should sports betting be in Illinois? We examined the winning design of O'Hare's new Terminal 2 project. We found that in prisons across the country, women receive a disproportionate number of disciplinary tickets for low-level offenses. A report produced locally details the discrepancy between the discipline given female and male inmates in U.S. prisons. Longtime WVON host and former alderman Cliff Kelly reflects on his career as he steps down from his afternoon talk show. I've enjoyed the meals. I've had meals uh, four times now. A new meal delivery service offers healthy eating to Chicago's so-called nutrition deserts. Don't you dare close your eyes. And he wrote the music to Aladdin, The Little Mermaid, and so much more. Legendary composer Alan Menken joins us at the piano to show us how he works. And in tonight's viewer feedback, your enthusiasm for Jay Shevsky's recent story about the remarkable discovery of these turn-of-the-century glass plate negatives and the surprising subject of these pictures. All that and more next on Chicago Tonight. Thank you for joining us. I'm Paris Schutz. Here's what's making news in Chicago tonight. President Trump is weighing in on the Jussie Smollett controversy, and he's vowing a federal investigation into the way Cook County State's attorney Kim Fox handled the abrupt dismissal of all the charges. The president this morning tweeted, quote, FBI and DOJ to review the outrageous Jussie Smollett case in Chicago. It is an embarrassment to our nation. Fox has come under fire for abruptly dismissing 16 felony charges against Smollett for allegedly filing a false police report and staging a fake attack. Smollett maintains his innocence. Also today, Mayor Emanuel is calling for Smollett to reimburse the city more than $130,000 for the cost of the police investigation. Smollett's lawyers issued this response, quote, It is the mayor and the police chief who owe Jussie owe him an apology for dragging an innocent man's character through the mud. Meanwhile, Smollett's lawyers say they will not seek to expunge the court records with the case. A plan to increase the state gas tax by 19 cents to fund road, bridge, and public transit construction gets big backing from big business today. The Illinois Chamber of Commerce says it supports the plan, noting that roads are in disrepair and the gas tax hasn't been raised in more than 20 years. The proposal would bring in an estimated $2 billion per year. Chicago's Cardinal Blaise Supich is in Springfield today along with the state's other archbishops. The group is urging legislators to defeat a pair of bills, one that would remove restrictions on late-term abortions and then another that would repeal the Parental Notice of Abortion Act. The bishops say the state should instead focus on efforts to help provide pregnancy care to those who need medical and financial help. It is critically important that each of us, but especially our elected leaders, defend the inherent and inalienable value of every human life. I call on our legislatures, legislators to reject these harmful bills. And in sports, baseball's opening day has at long last arrived. Out in the deep right, and it is gone! He's done it again! Our Javi Baez starts the season with a bang, going deep twice and knocking in four RBIs as the Cubs blow out the Texas Rangers by a final of 12-4 in Arlington, Texas. Meanwhile, the White Sox opened their season in Kansas City and are down 3 to nothing in the top of the seventh. Still plenty of time. As for the weather, there's a chance of showers overnight with a low around 39. Then tomorrow, partly sunny with a small chance of showers again and a high of 48. Well, it isn't a huge chunk, but Governor J.B. Pritzker's state budget plan calls for Illinois to legalize betting on sports. What exactly would that look like? Chicago Tonight's Amanda Vinicky is about to tell us. There's a lot of options. Amanda, why is Illinois looking to do this right now? Well, first and foremost, because Illinois needs more money. Also, because it can. Illinois and other states looking to 
get into the game, if you will, are able to do so I'll because you didn't of say a, that. yes, I had to because of a U.S. Supreme Court decision that came down last year, and then with, of course, MLB opening day and with March Madness, we figured it'd be a good time to check in on what those options are. Legislators, in fact, today spent hours on that, considering their options. Okay, so spell out those options for us. There are actually five major proposals that are underway, and that's because really everyone wants a piece of the action. Horse race tracks, the lottery, the Cubs, the Sox, the Bulls, the Blackhawks, casinos say that they're a logical host for both in-person and online betting. In order for it to be successful, they say Illinois should set some limits. Or no limits. Any yet. restriction on bet offers, for example, collegiate sports or different prop bets or in-game betting, or high taxes or any other additional fees creates an unlevel playing field so the black market operators can afford to offer materially better prices and products than the regulated ones. The point here being that the, the regulated market, the biggest challenge for the regulated market is to channel the players from the black market into the regulated, and hence the regulated market needs to be competitive. Illinois' three horse race tracks also want in on the action. They say it could revive an industry that supports thousands of jobs for trainers, breeders, even blacksmiths. In Illinois, legally, for almost 100 years now, legally, over 100 years, the race tracks have handled other people's money. We've taken their bets, we've taken their money, and we paid it out. There's been all problems, all kind of industry, but not a tinge of impropriety with handling other people's money where they make a bet and got the bet back. We've been doing it for 100 years. It makes no sense to have this form of gaming and not have it. Now, you also have 7,000 bars, restaurants, and other video gaming locations that are in just about every town in Illinois that say they would be optimal venues to host this. They say extra business for them would mean more sales, taxes for the state, and for municipalities. All right, Amanda, we just reported the Cubs won big. How do they and Not the, the Sox, other... sadly, huh? The Sox yeah. still have three Fingers innings crossed. to go. So how would uh, the Cubs, Sox, and the other pro sports teams play into this? They want Illinois to do what no other sports team or no other state that is has done thus far and that is to give MLB the NBA the NHL a cut of any wagers they also say they want a say in what type of wagers people are, are going to be able to make maybe a prohibition on someone being able to bet that an athlete will strike out for example bets that would be ripe for manipulation we want to ensure that when you go to a football game in Soldier Field that you know that everything that happens as a part of that contest is because the players on both sides of the ball are giving their best effort at all time. And we want to make sure that their family members that are watching them play that game in that location have the same ability to enjoy that contest as the folks that are around them. That someone trying to influence those players or their family members will be addressed. As I understand, the Illinois lottery plays into this somehow. What, what's that about? Well, maybe. There's a proposal. So just like now, you can go to any convenience store or gas station and buy a lottery ticket. This would allow you to go to any of those retailers and instead buy what's essentially a sports betting ticket. Backers of this say it might reap Illinois the most money up front, but detractors say that sports betting is a volatile business and it's a bad idea for Illinois and its taxpayers to take on that risk. Take the last Super Bowl, for example. The Patriots won, and some sports books lost as much as $2.5 million on that game. Imagine the headline if they were playing the Bears. Bears win Super Bowl, and state loses million in education, infrastructure, and pension re revenue. Traditional lotteries guarantee the state money. Sports betting does not. Amanda, what are the odds that any of these proposals become law? Paris, I'm not a betting woman, but as we started out this conversation saying Illinois certainly needs money and each of these plans would have the money going to education, to infrastructure, and to pay for pensions. So let's just say that there is definitely a good chance that all of th this, th a safe bet would be anyway, that they are going to make something happen. It just relies on all of these players coming to some sort of consensus and it's in their best interest to do so. And the governor wants this in the spring session, right? Yeah, he wants He's it to pass the before the end of May. Mm -hmm. All right, Amanda Vinicky, thank you so much. And now to Eddie Aruza and the architect, or on the architect and design chosen by 
O'Hare for that new terminal. Eddie. Paris hometown architect Jeannie Gang has landed the mammoth $8.5 billion O'Hare Terminal 2 project. Mayor Emanuel made that announcement yesterday following a competition for the much coveted project that was ultimately decided in secrecy. The renowned architectural firm has designed a 2 million square foot terminal they say will be filled with light, wood construction and lots of trees. It will more than double the size of the current terminal and be home to both domestic and international flights. And joining us tonight with their thoughts on the design and the future of airport travel at O'Hare are Ed Keegan, architect, architecture critic and contributing editor at Architect Magazine. And Mary Wisniewski, transportation writer for the Chicago Tribune. Thank you very much both for being here tonight. Thank you. Ed Keegan, you've already written uh, something of a review, a quasi-review, but an article on, on, this, uh, on this terminal. Jeannie Gang, of course, has a number of projects in town, either in the works or completed. The most uh, renowned, perhaps, is Writers Theatre up in Glencoe. Give me your review of what you've seen so far of this design. Well, I mean, Jeannie has been one of our leading lights for the last 20 years now, and she's actually finally reached the mature point of her career. One great thing about being an architect is you can reach your mid-50s, and that's when you finally become a mature architect. Um, but she's always been one of the most thoughtful and inventive architects that we have, and she's very good at creating narratives so that people who are not architects and not trained as architects will have something to talk about. So, for example, Aqua, we all know, is the downtown high-rise has you know has these wonderful swooping balconies that everybody can remember. So what's the now, narrative that you're seeing in this design? What we have here is a 2.2 million square foot facility. It'll be three sided with cur e each side curving one welcoming you from the from the roadways you come in from either you know you know from your car or your cab or your Uber. Um, but then these sort of three wings, these three sides that have these large vaulted spaces, which will have wood as the primary material that you'll see underneath them. Something Did you like that idea? I think it's a really fascinating idea. The whole question of what an airport should look like has it, it's vexed architects for almost 100 years now. Well, let me ask Mary about that because are the expectations of travelers in the 21st century airports changing and, and what are they expecting? They are different because of the security differences that have happened since the 9-11 tragedy. Uh, since the, because there's so much time spent at security, people have to get there so early, people end up spending a lot more time on the other side of security than they do on, you know, on the other, on, before they get to security. And so they want places to hang out. They want restaurant facilities, they want retail, um, you know, they want some space and they're not just sitting at the gates, you know, waiting in tight little chairs. And, you know, this is the expectation that's different than it used to be. And that's what airports are doing. In terms of the, 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 the again, going back to this design, it's really very preliminary at this point uh, at Keegan, as, as you probably well know as an architecture critic and an architect. So what might change? Is this plan not really fully hatched yet? Well, I mean, it's a conceptual design. So I think the major pieces in terms of the idea that there'll be three sides to it, it'll be, so it'll be triangular in plan, the idea that it will have these, these big soaring spaces within them, um, there are Y-shaped columns holding up, things like that are probably going to stay pretty true to what we see right now. But in terms of what those pieces are that Mary's talking about, what they look like will vary. Mary's colleague and you know my my old friend Blair Kamen revealed in an article in this morning's Tribune that Jeannie has already told him that that one of the renderings shows grass you know grassy areas with trees. It sounds like the trees are going to stay but they'll probably be in very discreet planters rather than lawn because maintaining a lawn indoors is something that's difficult I was to worried do. about the lawn. Yeah and really when you think of, of the kind of trash that gets thrown around in <laughs> airports it would be a lot harder to clean them up off of a lawn rather than a hard surface floor. But because they, they would end up as repositories for garbage and trash? Or Starbucks or is that yeah. is? I think so, or small children and pets. I, but, 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 but really, I mean, part of the experience of airports is what happens when you're there. Because we do tend, when you're traveling, to get trapped in these places. And so many of them are so soulless. And there's the possibility in this big, broad, large space to then have these very discrete areas. And Jeannie Gang has always been really good at working collaboratively with all of the sort of people who are going to be involved with this. So we're going to have, T we're going to have TSA involved with this. We're going to have uh, a, a lot of you know, input coming control. up in the, year, in the right. years ahead. Mary Wisniewski, uh, of course O'Hare is trying, or Chicago uh, in, by and large, is trying to keep up with other airports around the nation in, in 
modernizing and, and just uh, making sure that we have a, uh, a profitable uh, location here. What, what sort of, uh, what other airports across the country is, is Chicago looking at as it chooses this design and plans for the future? Um, a lot of other airports are making big changes. LaGuardia, Atlanta, Los Angeles, Denver has, has made a big expansion. I and think we're all thankful that LaGuardia is finally making <laughs> right. some changes. And, uh, but in so, terms of design and, and uh, outlook. Right, and so O'Hare has had to catch up. You know, it's, it's still this major, it's a major hub airport. It was the world's busiest airport and it may yet be again. It's got the, it's the busiest for in terms of number of flights in the nation and it may catch up on number of passengers too. And so what aviation experts have told me is that they, they really needed to catch up with the customer experience because it's still low as far as what people think of the airport itself as they're passing through. Does that really impact the number of passengers that an airport has, the, the, the terminal design and the layout? Yeah, because you can, the way that what they're doing is they're adding more gates and they're adding bigger spaces for bigger planes. And so it'll allow more planes to be there. And it, it should reduce the number of delays that O'Hare has. Of course, you can't change the weather, but you can change the number of gates where people come. $8.5 billion is the estimated price tag at this point. We should also point out that Jeannie Gang isn't the only, and her firm isn't the only architectural firm involved in this. Isn't that correct? And what will $8.5 billion really ultimately buy? It, 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 is, it is a team, and it's always a team involved with, pro with projects of this scale. With, with architectural firms actually from across the country? Architects, engineers, aviation consultants, all sorts of people, and then there are all the various stakeholders this that, is a lot that of jobs. we're talking about. Um, so, so, I mean, what really needs to happen now is this conceptual design needs to be fleshed out, and Jeannie will be convening with all of them. Um, and, of course, the decision for this was made by Mayor Rahm Emanuel, but as this goes forward, if the contract is signed, and I guess the contract now needs to be signed before, before the end of Emanuel's mayorality in two months, um, if it gets signed, then it will be up to the next mayor and their Department of Aviation people to really get things worked out. Let me ask you about the, that decision, that it ultimately came from the mayor's office, because the public did have some say. They asked for input, and you could leave cards and, and your you thoughts. You could make a vote, an online you vote. You could cast a vote, mm -hmm. uh, and but no one knows if those votes were really tallied and tabulated and what the public wanted, and it was decided in secret. I mean, is this the, was the fix in all along? Quite possibly. Given that this is we, Chicago, Ed, what do you think? We can only speculate. I can say that any time the public input is asked for something like this, it's always a bit of a charade, and that's truly unfortunate. Um, in 1989, when the Harold Washington Library competition was held, that jury, they, they did, they, they were, in public, they heard the presentations, but they deliberated in, in private. But there was, there was this massive outpouring of people leaving cards at the Chicago Cultural Center with their comments. Many of, many of which were in boxes that I saw only 15 plus years later. Um, <laughs> when, when, the in, when public is asked for input, and let's face it, everybody can have input now through Twitter, through Facebook, any you know, other forms of social media. We all know what people think about these things and we know it quicker than we, <laughs> quicker than we might actually I want to. I wanna get back to. to that competition from 30 years ago because there was an architect then who didn't make the cut, who, is, who didn't make the cut this time around and he has resurfaced <laughs> with some comments. But Mary, let me just ask you about the enormity of this plan and, and this, this um, um, uh, terminal. In terms of green, because there's so much push to go green, mm -hmm. it, will it be? Will there be a lot of energy efficiency in this? Is that something that just naturally will be uh, part of the? the planning uh, going forward? There should be more energy efficiency in this terminal because of the way it's designed with so much skylight, because that'll you know cut the amount of, of artificial light that you need to put into it. And the fact that there are trees within you know, might uh, you know, have, some, have some influence on that as well. Um, this is something that they're looking at going forward. This is something that's gonna be important to the design. They expect to break ground in 2023, but Terminal 5, which is the international ter terminal, just broke ground. Does that one need to finish before they take out of service? Right, or that's kind of part of the dominoes. Moment? They're going to, they're, they're moving some operations, they're moving Delta operations over to uh, what's now the international terminal. This new terminal is going to be both international and domestic. And the idea behind that is to make things easier for people to transfer from one flight to another so you won't have to be doing marathons across the airport.
Ed Keegan, the architect that I was referring to just a moment ago is Helmut Jahn, who uh, designed the Thompson Center, which people either love or hate, and uh, its future is, is up for uh, uh, debate at, at right now. Uh, but he submitted a plan in 1989 for the Harold Washington Library. It was not selected. And this time around, uh, he also submitted a plan, but he did not make the top five. And he wrote a very cryptic message in what is a very strange handwriting and posted it online. Does, does he have a point in terms of the process uh, of, of choosing this and, and whether there, there should have been a more open process? I think process is always going to be difficult when choosing architects because ultimately somebody needs to make the decision and no matter what the decision is, people are going to question it and that's just the way it's always been. I do think for me the most troubling thing, and I mean Helmut really has brought us the best architecture that there is at, at O'Hare right now, the United Terminal, Terminal 1, Terminal one. Um, which was f finished in 1986. It's still a fabulous piece of architecture. I flew out of it two days ago. but. What's interesting is he suggests in that cryptic message that, that it, perhaps the team is inexperienced, but I went and I did a little math. Jeannie right now is 55, Helmut was 46 when that terminal mm. opened. All right, we'll see whether his, his prophecy is true or whether it's just um, bad blood at this point. Ed Keegan and Mary Wisniewski, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you. Thanks, and architect Jeannie Gang will join us on April 8th to talk about the project. So. Be sure to join us for that. There's more Chicago Tonight just ahead, so please stay with us. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part through the generous support of the Julius Frankel Foundation. Still to come on Chicago Tonight, WVON host Cliff Kelly looks back on his career as a talk show host and a former alderman. How a new meal delivery pilot program is trying to reduce hospital and doctor visits in Chicago's food deserts. Aladdin composer Alan Menken joins us for a show and tell about the craft of hit songwriting. And in viewer feedback, your strong response to the discovery of these 125-year-old pictures in a Chicago attic. But first, to Brandis Friedman and a new study about reported inequities in Illinois prisons. Brandis. Women in prison are disproportionately disciplined compared to their male counterparts in some state prison systems, including Illinois. That's according to an investigation recently published by NPR and the Chicago Reporter. Our colleague here at WTTW, Jessica Pupovac, served as the lead reporter on that year-long investigation. And last month, she testified before the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights about the issue. And reporter Jessica Pupovac is joining us right here, right now. Welcome to the show, Jessica. Thank you, Brandis. So is there anything in particular that sparked this investigation? Yes, well, in uh, 2015 and 2016, a former Illinois Department of Corrections official, she was the second in command, Deanne Banos, formed an organization to go back in after she resigned and, uh, and investigate the conditions for women in Illinois prisons. Her and a team of researchers were granted unprecedented access to Illinois prisons, and they published a report in late 2016 that showed a number of problems in Illinois' uh, female prisons. Uh, women were um, being mistreated by staff. There was a, a severe lack of training on how to work with female offenders. But also um, one bullet point in the, in the uh, study that they did showed that women were being disciplined disproportionately for low-level offenses. And so myself and uh, Carrie Leiterson at Medill and um, the then editor of the Chicago Reporter were really interested in looking at what that meant, why that was, and, and what that meant for women and for their families, since the vast majority of women in prison in Illinois and around the country are mothers of small children. So in your research, yours along with Carrie Leiderson, what did you guys find? How did you find it? Well, um, we found... We, what we did was we looked at Illinois to, you know, and reached out to a lot of formerly incarcerated women, 
um, former corrections officials and current corrections officials, although they were um, less easy to uh, have honest conversations with, unfortunately. But, um, and we also requested data from across the country. I was really curious to know if this is an Illinois problem or if this is a corrections problem and a more widespread problem. And so what we did was we requested disciplinary data um, broken down by gender from 26 states and only 15 of those states actually had uh, data collected in a central place that they could share with us. And we analyzed that data and found that overwhelmingly across the country, uh, women are disproportionately disciplined for lower, lower level offenses. Things like talking back or having attitude, um, being disruptive or disrespectful. Um, who did you interview in this process? Obviously you mentioned prison officials, mm -hmm. current and former. Who else were you able to talk to? Um, I mean, we were able to speak with the former warden of Illinois' largest prison. She had re she retired right around the time that we started our investigation, um, and she was very forthcoming. We also interviewed um, the Car Carolyn Gursky, the current head of women's services in Illinois, um, and we interviewed a lot of academics um, and experts across the country. Um, we also were able to get into four prison systems across the country in California and Iowa and Vermont and um, talk with a lot of inmates, um, psychologists there, um, physicians, wardens, um, security staff. Yeah, so a lot, a, a real broad range of experts. What kind of uh, impact does this discipline have on the inmates? Well, um, there's a number of things. You know, it. Uh, some women told us that because the vast majority of women in prison um, have had severe uh, physical and sexual trauma in their in their past, it's actually women in prison have a higher incidence of PTSD than any other study demographic, including combat veterans. And uh, a lot of women talked about how the treatment by officers, the, um, you know, being put in restraints, being put in isolation, um, being yelled at, uh, these things tended to trigger past trauma. So for a lot of women, this was re-traumatizing and really hindered their ability to heal from that past trauma that might have led to their incarceration. Um, but it also, often uh, leads to the revocation of good conduct credits, which means that women end up serving more time in prison. Um, it can lead to the um, removal of privileges like phone privileges or contact visits with their kids um, or commissary privileges. And so it, it means that a lot of women end up serving harder time um, than their male counterparts. We found that in the states that provided longitudinal data connecting the infraction to the um, punishment that the women got, women were punished more severely for these lower level infractions as well. Uh, you testi testified, excuse me, before the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights recently. Mm -hmm. um, do you think they'll act on this information? What kind of reaction did you get? Well, you know, they, they heard um, our series on NPR and read the series in the Chicago Reporter. And they were very interested because this was the first time that anyone had really quantified this problem. Um, and they, you know, I think that what they do, what the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights does, they were created um, as part of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and they monitor the implementation of that law. Um, and so they will be issuing a report to Congress and probably to the Bureau of Prisons, to related agencies, to the DOJ, um, pointing out potential violations of the Civil Rights Act and ways that the federal government might be able to use carrots and sticks to help promote best practices and more responsible um, approaches to female incarceration. Okay, Jessica Popovac, sounds like a follow-up story for you there to see if there's <laughs> anything that, uh, that comes of that. Thank you for joining Thank us. Thank you. Absolutely. Now, Paris, back to you. Thanks, Brandis. Meal delivery services sprouting up around Chicago provide kits of every taste and dietary restriction that you prepare at home. They offer dishes at a price that's usually not out of reach for many customers. But now a pilot program is underway in Chicago that aims to offer those same healthy meals at a reasonable price to communities regarded as nutrition deserts where hospitalizations are higher because of that. Eddie Arusa has that story. The dishes prepared every day at Kitch Fix, a meal delivery service in the West Town neighborhood, are for customers who want a carefully crafted entree they can cook at home. 
Many of those customers are busy professionals who want a meal that's not a run-of-the-mill carryout and who can afford a subscription costing a minimum of about $60 per week. But last month, Kitch Fix began preparing entrees for people like Joan Owens. Like I could, used to could go to the store. I can't go to the store anymore because I can't see the things on the, on the shelves. So I have to have someone with me at all times. 82-year-old Joan Owens lives in the Morgan Park neighborhood on Chicago's far south side, and she's legally blind. While that hasn't stopped her from living a vibrant life, she's among the tens of thousands of Chicagoans who could use a little help in accessing healthier foods like the ones made at Kitch Fix. And now Ms. Owens does have access to them. Sometimes I don't feel like cooking. I'm an excellent cook, but I don't feel like cooking all the time at my young age. Recently, the Blue Cross Blue Shield Institute, a subsidiary of the insurance giant, launched a pilot program called Food Q. It offers low-cost prepared meals along with delivery to areas of the city that the institute has determined to be deserts on several fronts, nutrition, transportation, pharmacy, and fitness. Using what it calls proprietary data, the institute made some discoveries. Once we saw those nutrition deserts were leading to avoidable hospitalizations and avoidable ER visits, then we identified zip codes in Chicago that we said we can target them for food queue uh, delivery services. The Blue Cross Blue Shield Institute identified 25 Chicago zip codes that meet the criteria. And anyone in those zip codes qualifies to take part in the food queue pilot program. As to what constitutes a nutrition desert, whether or not someone could either walk to that grocery store or have easy access to the to the grocery store. So the USDA defines the, the food desert that way. And most people think about it as eight tenths of a mile. Joan Owens says she heard about the Food Q program on WVON radio and signed up. For the time being, Food Q delivers only a few days per week. For those who register, the meals cost five dollars a piece with free delivery. Many seniors will find that they will enjoy those meals. Five dollars is fine. I would spend probably more than that going to the store. What we want to do is make it simple and easily and manageable for people to be able to understand their meal planning. So the queue is really a queue, just like you think, what we call it healthy living in the bag. You can go onto the website, there is a queue as in Q-U-E, U-E, and you manage that queue. Food Q customers have access to a wide array of healthy meals that range from vegan and paleo to healthier versions of more traditional fare. The pilot program is currently being conducted in Dallas as well as Chicago and will continue on into the foreseeable future. But the Blue Cross Blue Shield Institute says it will consider expanding the program to more days per week and more locations nationwide as it evaluates new data later this year. We'll be able to see on the back end, that takes a little longer, six months to 12 months to be able to see. Now are we seeing better healthy behavior patterns? Are we starting to see avoidable hospitalizations, avoidable ER? For her part, Joan Owen says she now awaits her food queue deliveries with great anticipation, especially a couple of dishes that have become her favorites. I love mushrooms and I love the rice fried mushrooms, but the best meal was the salmon with the um, maple crust on it. And in Chicago neighborhoods where healthy eating is not a common practice, Food Q might lead the way to more such services that could improve an entire community's health. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Eddie Aruza. On our website, you can see the zip code where Food Q operates and learn more about the program. That's the map of the zip code where Food Q operates. Well, tomorrow, the man nicknamed the governor of talk radio is stepping down from his afternoon post. For a quarter century, Cliff Kelly parsed politics and discussed the issues impacting Chicago as the afternoon radio talk show host on WVON 1690 AM. Last month, the former alderman announced that tomorrow would be his final day as the station's afternoon host, calling the move a rewiring, not a retirement. And joining us to reflect back on his career is the man himself, Mr. Cliff Kelly. Welcome back to Chicago Tonight. It's a pleasure to be here. It's good to you see you again. You do such a great job. Well, thank you, Cliff. Thank so you first of all, well, yeah. why step down? Well, at this point, uh, there's a lot of other things I want to be doing. And I still will have a show on the weekend. Uh, it's called America's Heroes Group. I'm a veteran, and this is an organization that, that, you know, we've got so many veterans with so many problems, as you well know. And uh, this is a show, it's an organization actually, it's not just a show, 
that helps veterans. So we're able to do a lot of things for people, and that, that's a big help. And this is going to be a weekly show on Saturday. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a weekly show. But then uh, there are some other things I'm going to be doing, too. And I want to do some volunteering because, you know, there are so many things that need to be done, and uh, there are a lot of folks out here who need some help. I'm a member of a different, some community organizations. Some organizations I've been in, maybe they'll take me back, <laughs> you know, like the American Civil Liberties Union, uh, the Illinois chapter. Well, one you organization you probably don't want to go back to is the Chicago City Council. Of course, you were 20, <laughs> 20th Ward Alderman yeah, for a long uh, time. Right. So you had these dual careers, Alderman and then uh, radio host, but yeah. you, you did them at the same time at one point. Tell sure us how you broke yeah. into radio. Uh, Bruce Dumont. Uh, we all know Bruce Dumont. Know the name. Yep. Familiar name. When I was in the council, he came up with this great idea about having uh, once a week in the evening a show relative to politics. And I knew Bruce and he would invite me on and I just think it surprised all of us at how many people talked about that show uh, once a week. Uh, and then I did a show with a gentleman on BEZ who was a finance professor uh, and that worked well, politics and finance, of course, the George Caledonis. And uh, Bruce just uh, built that up to the point where, you know, other people said, well, you need to do a show over here. And I ended up working for four different stations. So. And in, in many of that time, you were at WVON 1690, as we mentioned. Right. Mm -hmm. what, are the, what are the moments that stand out for you in, in your more than two decades on the air? Some of the things that I just remember that uh, are just great are some of the interviews we've done. Of course, uh, I'll tell you somebody, if I was uh, not able to do my show, a person who used to sit in for me quite often was Barack Obama. Well, I think you know him. <laughs> you know, this was when he was a Rings state. Rings a bell. Uh, yeah, rings a bell. So he sat in and hosted your show yeah, when you were gone. Yeah, a number of times, yeah, if I was away. Uh, Did you have to mentor him and say, look, buddy, this is how it's done? <laughs> he was pretty smart. He was here <laughs> even as the state senator. And uh, some of the organizations I've been in have helped me a lot. I was with the uh, American Political Science Organization, which uh, was with the uh, State Department and would send you to different places and so forth. So I got a lot of information in different places that I was able to bring back to whatever show I was doing. So it, it worked very well. We mentioned WVON is known as the voice of the African-American community in Chicago. Right. Mm -hmm. how, how has the, have the fortunes for the African-American community changed uh, since when you began uh, up until this point? Well, one of the things uh, that certainly made a big difference is, you know, we had the, talking about being in the city council, the situation with the election of Harold Washington was certainly one of the big points because I was doing both at that time. But uh, the, uh, there have been a lot of people who, through WVON, because we've got some great hosts there, that are doing things that are really helping the community. And we've got a lot to be done, obviously. And that's what's happening right now. As you well know, this election coming up is going to be, uh, it is interesting already, but there are many, many things that need to be done in the community. And that's one of the things I, I hope to do. And, that's, and, and you've been talking about those things for many years. Right. Um, but, and we want to talk about the election, but first, you know, it's well known that as an alderman, you, ha you had a career as an alderman, and then you pled guilty to bribery charges. You spent some time in prison. What did you yeah. learn from that experience? Well, I would have, uh, that was called entrapment. There were four of us, not just me, there were four of us. Uh, and we found out that this person who came in was sent by the government and he was supposed to show us how to collect money for parking tickets. All four of us were with Washington. And, uh, you know, if, if, we, if, if we had the money, we should have not done what we did. But nine months, they said, well, just do nine. Yeah, fine. So uh, that was an unfortunate situation, but it didn't stop me from doing anything. Well, mm -hmm. and, and you were alderman of the 20th Ward, yeah. and the 20th mm -hmm. Ward has had this history. Alderman Arenda mm -hmm. Troutman, she was yeah. convicted. Mm -hmm. Now Alderman Willie Cochran pled guilty. What, what do you believe is behind the problems uh, in the 20th Ward? Uh, no different than any other wards that are in poor areas. Uh, it's, it's no different. Uh, I live there. I still live in the 20th Ward. Uh, my neighbors are great. Uh, the people do good things. So that's just happened. Uh, well, you talked it, about being entrapped. Do you think that the same oh, fate absolutely. kind of befell Troutman and Willie Cochran? Well, I don't know about them. I know about the four of us. I know if we had had the money, we could have fought that. 
because it's definitely a law against entrapment. But it, uh, we went to lawyers and we didn't have the money to do what we wanted to do. But uh, when the government sends somebody in to tell you we have a way of helping the mayor that we are supporting, meaning Harold Washington, to help collect all these parking tickets, the guy who set us up ended up going to jail himself. In fact, he died in jail. The same guy who set us up. Kind of similar so, to Operation Silver Shovel. I, yeah, I, I want to fast forward now. Right. We, we talked about the current mayor's race. Um, how, how do you reflect on the fact that it's two African-American women vying for this job? I think it's great. I, I'm surprised, I should say that. But uh, when you have 24 people running for mayor and someone who many people have never heard of ended up first, I'm speaking of attorney Lori Lightfoot, of course, that's an amazing thing in itself. Does, does anyone resonate more with your listeners? Uh, we have big supporters for both. We have big supporters for both. Some people think this, though. They think that if Lori wins, uh, she'll be the mayor, obviously. And if uh, Preckwinkle wins, uh, she will leave the position she has now, which is a very important position as president of the Cook County Board of Commissioners and who replaces her will probably not be a person of color. So what you're saying is if Lori Lightfoot wins, both the Cook County Board President and the Mayor yeah, will be a person exactly. of color. Exactly. Cliff mm -hmm. Kelly, congratulations on your retirement. We look forward to the, to the weekly show and thank you for being here. Good. Thank you so much for inviting me. All right, no All problem. Right. Mm -hmm. And we're back with the man behind scores of songs you know and love, so stick around. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Allstate. Allstate is investing in Chicago's youth. We believe good starts young. That's why we're helping our youth develop the skills they need to achieve success in life. Allstate is proud to empower the next generation of leaders. Songwriter Alan Menken is without question one of today's finest composers for Hollywood movies and Broadway musicals. His memorable scores for The Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast, both written with his late great writing partner Howard Ashman, helped launch a renaissance of Walt Disney Animation Studios 30 years ago. He also worked on the upcoming live action film of Aladdin and he's performing his one man show this Saturday night at the Auditorium Theater. We could go on about his eight Oscars, his Grammys and his Tony Award, but we'd rather just welcome him to Chicago tonight and chat with him. Welcome to Chicago Tonight, Alan Menken. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to get some demo. We're going to talk a little bit. So the, the first very obvious question, you have so many hit songs that stick in people's heads. Under the Sea, Be Our Guest, Whole New World. When do you know that you have one of those big hits on your hands? Well, you don't really know necessarily. It's really about, because you know, we're telling a story and we're writing for characters, and I want to make sure we served that purpose in the best possible way. Um, and with every score, I want to have a big idea, you know, like a stylistic idea, of, you know, that it, wouldn't it be fun to put some Calypso into Little Mermaid because, you know, it, it is water and that's a culture that feels, it just felt right. Or to put a little bit of Fats Waller into Aladdin because the genie kind of has that kind of look to him. And, or to put some French musical, of course, into uh, Beauty, uh, and the Beauty and the Beast. Can you give us a little bit of example of that calypso? And, uh, the calypso, well, absolutely. It's like a steel drum kind of. That uh, film, Little Mermaid, was uh, on in, in my household growing up about 10 times a day because I had a younger oh. sister who was obsessed with it, so I know every word and absolutely love that song. Um, you know, Little Mermaid was kind of a reboot for Disney. Talk about how that came about. Well, you mean the original Little Mermaid? The original Little Mermaid well, in 1989. Yeah. Well, you know, obviously Disney had really lost the animation, you know, uh, thing that Walt started prior to us coming back. Uh, or basically prior to uh, Michael Eisner and Jeffrey Katzenberg coming back to Disney. And, um, and they began to, to you know, to re give rebirth to that, and it was really Roy Disney who, um, that was his passion. And, and along with Michael Eisner and Jeffrey Katzenberg and Roy, um, Howard Ashman and I were... You know, Howard Ashman, your writing partner, my, my long time great, yeah, writing like partner. Great writing partner, book writer, lyricist, director, genius, Howard Ashman. We were offered the opportunity to come and try to write animated you know, musicals that could sit on the shelf alongside Snow White and 
Cinderella and, and Sleeping Beauty. And uh, it was an amazing opportunity because, you know, frankly, what we had done leading up to that was Little Shop of Horrors. So it's like quite a stretch, but Howard had an amazing uh, ability to understand how to use songs with, with spoken and with drama. And, um, and you know, it, for us, it was sort of our follow-up to Little Shop, but instead of doing, telling a story of a man-eating plant <laughs> through uh, doo-wop and, and through um, 60s rock and roll, well, we're telling the story of Little Mermaid through really the world of Walt Disney from our perspective, the, the kind of eclectic influences that were always in the classic Disney. And as pictures. I understand, there's a movie in the works with Lin-Manuel Miranda co-producing. Can you tell us anything about that? Well, Lin is going to be writing lyrics to, to, um, with, you know, to my new songs that I'll be writing for that. We're is having, it all new songs or are you using oh, some of the no, old no, no, songs? No, no, no. Okay. All the, the original songs are all in. Just that whatever new songs we're going to write will be a collaboration with me and Lin. Uh, Rob Marshall's directing and um, we are actually having our first creative meeting in about 10 days. So, oh, wow. So we're, uh, right? Yes, because it's, Rob had to fi uh, just finished up, and Lynn was also in it, the uh, Mary Poppins Returns movie. And I just finished up Aladdin, and now the slate is clear, and we start Little Mermaid. Speaking of Aladdin, uh, can you play anything from Aladdin for us? You, you spoke about the musical influences you tried to weave into that movie. What do you mean? Well, obviously, first, the Middle Eastern, Lara music. And also you have the, the camel going over the, <laughs> the um, boom, boom, boom. That's one influence. And you have the genie, of course, and... Oh, my. No, no. <laughs> you want to get that... That's Waller's stride piano style. Well, Alabama had them 40 thieves. Shaharazadi had a thousand tails. That was Robin Williams' character, Well, correct? yes. Initially, I really wanted a fast Waller sound. Right, right. Well, Alabama. And then he said, we, we cast Robin Williams. And I said, great, <laughs> but can he sing like Fats Waller? And they said, Alan, we don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and Robin learned every note and, and actually did a perfectly great Fats Waller and then when that was all in the can, everyone said, can we now let Robin just have fun? And it goes, went wild. Speaking of having fun, you're doing this show. You're taking it to the Auditorium Theater on Saturday. Is this what this show is, just kind of chatting and playing? And Well, except there isn't, you're not there. No, I won't be there. <laughs> there is, or there isn't a stand-in for you. So it's me and the audience. I play. I talk about the, you know, the stories behind the songs. I have three screens uh, in back of me that have either visuals or sometimes a little bit of video or just information. So it's kind of, you know, everything you wanted to, everything you didn't want to know about Alan Menken or you did. <laughs> but we're afraid to ask? <laughs> exactly. Well, here, here's something uh, I'm not afraid to ask. How about an obscure song that you think doesn't get enough credit? Can you play one of those first? Because we know Aladdin, we know Beauty and the Beast, we know Little Shop of Horrors. Well, I could play you something that was written for, for Little Shop of Horrors that never made it okay. in. The, for the original concept of Little Shop, um, it, what we, before we arrived at doing it as sort of as the dark side of Greece, there's a song <laughs> that went, When it's time to pick a pet flower, who's the shrub we love? Who's our potted plant of the hour? Who's our bush when push comes to shove? Who rakes in that cash? Those kudos, look by who came through. Not Audrey Hepburn or Audrey Wood, the both those ladies are well and good. The dismal failures beside the beautiful Audrey too. And then you see the little pods open up. Audrey, <laughs> Audrey, Audrey too. So is this on the collector's edition uh, of the DVD, perhaps? It. I, I think we may have. We might have actually released it on, on a. Uh, when we did the Broadway album, I think we did some sort of lost track kind of things. Yeah. So, you know, you grew up in New York, you went to, was it NYU in, in the late 60s, yeah. uh, a, a very uh, emerging time for musicians. Was this your aspiration to compose music for hit Disney musicals? No, no, I grew up loving Disney musicals. I grew up in a family that were, all, suspect all the men were dentists, so I, <laughs> <laughs> that was not going to happen. Um, but I knew I loved writing music and of course I, I went, went to school and 
left home in the uh, late 60s. So like any other young man at that time, I wanted to be Bob Dylan or the Beatles. Um, to appease my parents, because we were very concerned, what's, what's going to happen to Alan? Um, I joined a workshop called the BMI Musical Theater Workshop, taught by this wonderful conductor named Lehman Engel, who's conducted Proggy and Bess and tons of Broadway classic musicals, and also really studied how it was done from the point of view of the pit. And through that workshop, I developed a, a real appreciation for the opportunity of writing musicals because, you know, if I was going to be a recording artist, I'm sort of pulling on, you know, my emotions and, oh, my dreams or my thoughts, which are fine, but there's a limit to that as opposed to a story with different characters and different musical vocabularies and different collaborators. So you're going to have to step outside yourself. Uh, well, but yet you're within yourself. But the opportunities just become so rich to work in the field of, of musicals. It's, it, uh, you know, I still feel like I am Ariel or I am Belle or I am any of the characters in the movie. That's my voice coming through them and, of course, the lyricists as well. But, but beyond that, the, it's, it's this opportunity to just have songs that are of different, different shapes and sizes and different types. And you have so many irons in the fire. You have a live-action Aladdin movie opening up soon. Right. Can you explain how you tinkered with that while trying to stay true to the original? Well, and you know, first of all, we did the Aladdin um, musical for for Broadway, and for and it was here in Chicago. And for that one, we went back to the earliest roots. So we had Howard and I had conceived the movie almost as a homage to the Hope Crosby Road picture. It's kind of a buddy picture. It became a romance for the for the animated that the Broadway show kind of had that style. For the live action movie. It's back to the original intent, but with a number of changes. One, Guy Ritchie directing. He really wanted much more of a pop edge to the songs, and and we got there in a really exciting way. You know, and so it worked out really well. And then I, I collaborated with um, Benj Pasek and Justin Paul, who wrote Greatest Showman and oh and, and La La Land and um, uh, Dear Evan Hansen, and they, they wrote lyrics to a uh, um, couple of new songs with me for the new Aladdin movie. And one of them is a song for, for Jasmine. Um, and it's really empowerment song. It's called Speechless. And she's told early in the film, you, you know, you should be seen and not heard. And she said, no, I won't remain speechless. And that's that song, which I don't think I'm yet allowed to, to play and play. I could play a little t taste of it. Sure, why don't you do that? Just this. I'm not going to go beyond that, but it's, I'm very happy with the song and I can't wait for people to hear Sounds it. Sounds very esoteric, very emotional. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a good song. I'm Alan Menken, well thank you so much, we look forward to that. And uh, I'm going to read the closing copy here, can you play us out while I read this copy? What would you like me to play? Something, something that I can read over. Okay. And again, Alan Menken performs his one-man show, A Whole New World of Alan Menken, this Saturday night at the Auditorium Theater. Find out more on our website, and we are back with your viewer feedback in just a moment. Menken's taking your request right after the show here. Ah, I'm just kidding. Before we go, some viewer feedback. Last week, Jay Shevsky brought us a remarkable story. The discovery in a Chicago attic of a rare glass plate negative from the 1890s. Even more remarkable, the little girl in these pictures went on to become a groundbreaking foreign correspondent for the Chicago Tribune. The story quickly went viral on Facebook, getting more than 100,000 views and nearly 2,000 shares in just a few days. Fantastic story, Chicago Tonight. Congratulations on another fascinating local story. I don't know which is more interesting, the salvager and his discovery or the significance of this family to Chicago history. Dude, Chicago Tonight is blowing my mind right now. That was the best thing I saw all week. Thank you. So glad that gut instinct led Neuter to find these glass plates before what had just been journalist Sigrid Schultz's family home was torn down. 
Wouldn't this story make a great movie? Really interesting all the way around. Such a wonderful window into the past, all from an old attic. As always, we appreciate hearing from you. Join the discussion on Facebook and Twitter or post your comments on our website. And that's our show for this Thursday night. Stay connected by signing up for our daily briefing and join us tomorrow night at 7 for the Week in Review. And a few notes before we go. Earlier this school year, Sen High School students toured our WTTW studios and pitched their own story ideas to Chicago Tonight's staff. You can visit our website to watch these two video stories these young, emerging young journalists produced and read about how they work together with our team. And finally, to note uh, tonight, a personal note, after 15 years with Chicago Tonight, correspondent Eddie Aruza is moving on. As you certainly know, Eddie has long been a dogged reporter, a fierce but fair interviewer, a lover of the arts, and a space fanatic. He's also a consummate professional, and he leaves Chicago Tonight with the affection and admiration of our entire staff. We wish him well, and we know he will succeed at whatever he decides to do next. And you can see him hosting one more time on the Week in Review tomorrow night. Eddie, on behalf of all of us, thank you for all of your contributions to this show. On a personal note, I remember meeting you when I was an intern about 13 or 14 years ago. You couldn't have been more gracious, and it's been a pleasure to work alongside you and learn from you. You will sorely be missed from Chicago tonight. And we leave you tonight on this opening day of baseball season with three Chicago greats. Chicago Tonight founder John Calloway, along with Jack Brickhouse and Harry Carey in 1979. We also have two now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, Brickhouse I'm Paris Schutz. I thank you for watching. Good evening. not going to go to any questions from this wonderful studio audience until we have a little song led by you. Oh, come no. Come no, on. No, no, oh, come on. No. I'll, I'll start it. to the ball game, take me out to the crowd, buy me some peanuts and cracker jacks, I don't care if I ever get back, oh it's root, root, root for the Lions. Closed captioning for this program is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, proud sponsors of the Chicago Bar Foundation's Investing in Justice campaign that supports pro bono and legal aid organizations for the needy throughout the Chicago area.